Okay, in the previous lecture we had talked about Kepler and his three laws of motion. And what he did was he came up with mathematical um, patterns that describe the motion of the planets pretty nicely. And he took into account, for instance, with his first law, he gave a consistent factor. The sun is the focal point of each of the planet's elliptical orbits. And this was, of course, very groundbreaking because nobody else had considered using elliptical orbits. He also came up with a second law, which was very nice because it, it allowed you to explain, mathematically at least, a reason for the varying speeds of the planets. It didn't actually tell us why they speed up and slow down, but it gave us a way to understand um, where it's going to be at any given point in time. And then he had a third law, which links each of the motions of the planets to the sun. Uh, so there is a sort of overarching relationship. And this is kind of a teaser for later on, because this was something that Newton really focused in on and was able to figure out the reason for this. Um, now, one of the things that I think is important is that we just look at what did Kepler do differently than his predecessors. And there were lots of different aspects to model making. And as far as what did Kepler not do, that's probably almost as important or more important than what he did do. So his predecessors were definitely influenced by aesthetics, meaning beauty. They really wanted um, circles because they thought that they were the most beautiful shape and the perfect shape and that type of thing. Um, everybody was influenced by data, Kepler and all of his predecessors. But Kepler was probably more influenced by the data. He wanted to be, and this is really kind of a difference, he wanted to be faithful to the data more so than he wanted to be face faithful to the aesthetics. Um, he was definitely influenced by previous models. There's no question about it. It helped that Copernicus had come up with a heliocentric model prior to um, Kepler uh, because it made it easier for him to look at that research and that model as well to try to formulate his idea of elliptical orbits as being the answer, but with the sun at the center. And this is one area where I think he, he wasn't as influenced by, uh, as, as so many of his peers, was by societal pressures, because there certainly was still a taboo on the heliocentric model, and he was working with it. And there was definitely a taboo on using anything but circles, because circles were the perfect shape. So he really went against a lot of the ideas that had been used prior to him in terms of making a model. And that brings us to Galileo Galilei. Now, Galileo was around at the same time as Kepler. This is the first time we've really dealt with true contemporaries. Um, if you look at when Kepler is around 1571 to 1630, Galileo 1564 to 1642. So Galileo was born just a couple years before, lived a couple years later, but they were active at the same time and actively researching planetary motion at the same time. And Galileo was absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's no question about it. One of the most brilliant scientists and mathematicians of all time. He was arrogant. He liked to embarrass his peers. He liked to get an audience together, basically, and just shut down the arguments of his peers on, on anything, really. He just wanted to show that he was superior. And he liked the Copernican model, but he was quiet about it for a long time because there was a taboo against it. He was in Italy. Uh, that was where the Roman Catholic Church had its base, and they were very much against the Copernican model. So it was best for him to keep quiet. However, in about 1609, Galileo got a telescope. And at the time, the telescopes were very, very new, and the quality was very poor. Uh, but it was still pretty exciting, because you could see things bigger, at least, if not clearer, that were far away. And Galileo immediately realized the impact that this could have on his research. So he decided to become the best lens maker in the world. It happens. This is the sort of guy that Galileo was, sort of as a side job. He just gets better than anybody else in the world at it. Um, so what he was able to do in less than two years was he went from a fuzzy four times magnification to a fairly clear 35 times magnification lens. Um, this was the lens that he was given. This is what he managed to get to in, in about two years. So it was a huge jump, a huge achievement, almost a 10 times increase in terms of the, the um, magnification that he was able to achieve. And what he saw through this telescope uh, would really revolutionize the world. So one thing that he saw was four or moons orbiting Jupiter. And we'll talk about each of these uh, things in more detail. Mountains on the moon, moving spots on the sun, 
phases of Venus, uh, rings of Saturn, but he, he couldn't actually see that they were rings of Sa rings. He just saw these sort of fuzzy shapes around Saturn that looked strange. And he also was able, for the first time, to look at the Milky Way and realize that there's something to this thing, this whitish, palish blotch that runs across the sky. He was able to see that it's actually made up of individual stars. So let's talk about Jupiter's moons first. So one of the things that this does is it shows that things can orbit around more than just the Earth, which immediately shows that the sort of the Ptolemaic mentality of the Earth is the center of everything and everything revolves around the Earth is not true. It doesn't prove that the Earth isn't the center of the universe, but it just proves that that mentality is incorrect. So the Tychonic model, where everything orbited the Sun except for the Sun and the Moon, which orbited the Earth, that was still, that, uh, that kind of went along with what uh, Galileo was seeing. And of course the Copernican model was given a little bit of support by this as well. Um, he also saw the phases of Venus. And it's important to, to note that the phases of Venus were had been noticed prior to this time. But it was difficult to discern all the details about the phases. So what he was able to see was that when Venus was full or nearly full, Venus was small. It was further away. When Venus was nearly new Venus, meaning we can't really see it, or just like a crescent, just a sliver, it was actually fairly big. It was a fairly big um, structure, a wide span, a wide radius. So this indicated that it was getting further and closer to the sun at these times. And the manner in which it did it, the pattern of the motion, was consistent with something orbiting the sun, not something orbiting the Earth that also happens to be orbiting the sun. So it became pretty clear to him that Venus was orbiting the Sun. Once again, this disproves Ptolemy, but not Tycho. Um, it, it really lends support to both of the cases for Copernicus and for the Tychonic model. Um, some more things. The stars in the Milky Way. So by looking at the Milky Way, if you look at it without a telescope, it looks like just a blur of, of palish white. But if you are able to look at it more closely, you can actually see the individual dots of stars. And so what this indicates is because we can see some stars more clearly than others, it does kind of indicate that some are closer than others. Um, also that some are, are simply brighter than others. It, it kind of explains, first of all, it explains the lack of parallax that we observe because the stars really are very far away. If we can't make out the individual dots unless we magnify them a great deal, then that means that some are definitely farther away than others. Um, and they must be super far away in order for that not to change how we observe them. Um, so this was a, a, a huge blow to the Ptolemaic type of mentality and it also just shattered the crystal and sphere model because that had the stars plastered on an outer sphere that was th had them all the same distance away. So this was a very big deal. Uh, this one wasn't quite as big of a deal but it did really irritate people. So he saw for instance the mountains on the moon and the valleys on the moon and these are sketches that he made and it's quite clear quite obvious to any neutral looker observer that these are craters that these are mountains that there's ridges here um, and he also saw the sunspots on the sun you might be wondering how did he see the sunspots on the sun he looked at the sun through a telescope this was not maybe the brightest thing that he's ever done or that he ever did uh, and he did eventually go blind there might be a correlation between the two uh, this didn't really prove anything other than that the heavenly bodies, which had been thought to be perfect, were not. Uh, this really didn't do anything other than irritate the Inquisition, which was active at the time. And hopefully that will give you a tip off as to where we're going to be going. So, the initial response to all of this was not great. And I think we'll, we'll pick up with that uh, at the next video.